I would say that the most pivotal changes in our society occurred in the late 1950s and the 1960s. 1955 dawned the era of school desegregation and the 1960s gave us the Civil Rights Movement and the 1964 Civil Rights Act. The movement and the legislation was driven by many moments when there were protests. Much of it was peaceful and often when there was violence it was precipitated by police action trying to control the crowds. I will say we know much more about how to do effective crowd control now than we did 50 years ago. And once again, just a quick plug for the movie Selma. It's worth watching to get a sense of how things played out and how the social movement and the ability of the world to see instant images via television, i.e. the use of technology, may have been the pivotal factor in getting President Johnson to sign the 1964 Civil Rights Act. The starting point of social movements is in creating a group consciousness, an awareness by the group that they face common problems and issues that need to be resolved. Since often these groups lack a voice or any real power in changing policies, they must then call attention to themselves, which then allows more group members to identify with that group and join in a call to action. Most often, protests are doing just that, people joining together to raise overall awareness about an issue. That was the reason for the march from Selma to Montgomery. They can be done in other ways, such as work-ins, teach-ins, die-ins, and occupations. Our country is relatively diverse, though not as diverse as some, such as Brazil or Canada. At the same time, the U.S. was considered diverse in 19th and 20th century due to Western European and Chinese immigration, though there were also strong expectations of assimilation. During the earlier years of our country, ethno-racial minorities accounted for 83% of U.S. population growth during the first decade of the 21st century. Currently, the largest growth for the U.S. is in the Latino population. And we are changing in regards to religious affiliation. The U.S. is no longer a Christian country. The Christian denominations are shrinking while other religions are growing. From the 1990s to 2008, the number of Muslims and Buddhists in the U.S. rose from 1 to 2.5 million. From 1990 to 2008, the Lutheran Church dropped 5.2 percent, the Presbyterian Church dropped 5 percent, the United Methodist Church dropped 20 percent, and the Episcopal Church dropped 21 percent. Race, too, is a strong theme in the notion of diversity and inequality. There are success stories. Some people do have success with social mobility. But remember that it usually takes about five generations to move from one social class to another, so we're not as socially mobile as we might think. And there are success stories in government, too, not just in the private sector. But overall, status and privilege are still based on skin color and perception of race. And then let's also consider one of the central questions of diversity. Do we promote assimilation or multiculturalism? I think we have to be aware of our similarities, but not expect people to change or forget their cultural heritages. Diversity enhances our life and even the productivity at work when we can have competing ideas, when people bring their differences to the table and can debate what may be the best option. It's diversity of ideas that spawns innovation because if we all subscribed to the same ideas and traditional ways of doing things, nothing would ever change. And of course we are changing demographically so that the ethno-racial minority will tip over to the majority around 2042, or at least so says the U.S. Census Bureau. So as our melting pot grows, there may be more divisions among ethno-racial lines. And it's important to understand that increases in acceptance rarely happens unless efforts are made to integrate and coach individuals to acceptance. And I just want you to know that the most innovative places on earth tend to be the places where lots of people come together. Cities are generally the place where innovation happens because they have more diverse populations and people are together in close proximity. Therefore, they can interact more. Historically, river ports and seaports were the most diverse because you had people from all over traveling to those destinations before the advent of steam. 
The main means of transporting goods and people over long distances was by ship or over water, whether it by sea or by river.